feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But it's a- hey everyone, I'm Mark Scribner. I'm your host with my co-host Michael Keel today on The Shrimp Tank, where book smarts and street smarts collide. I'd like to let everyone know that you can follow this show, all previous shows on Google, Stitch, SoundCloud, Anywhere that you can follow, find your podcast, we are nationally syndicated to iHeart. You can follow us at theshrimptank.com forward slash Boston. There's also 13 cities that have amazing episodes all across the country with different entrepreneurs speaking about different topics. Um, we uh, are very excited today to have a guy. He's primarily on the show today just because he has a weird accent. Not that he can impart any actually good knowledge today, but awesome. all kidding aside, we have Dave Seymour today from Freedom Venture. A uh, really interesting tidbit about Dave is he was uh, prominently featured in Flip Your House through the A&E network, which is was really popular uh, back in the day. Ironically, we're kind of back to that environment a little bit with the crazy real estate values that everyone has seen. Uh, so with that said, how you doing, mate? I'm I'm all right, my old China. How are you? You know, if you want me to go the full London accent, Mac, and then throw in a little Boston on top of it, we can do that. Man, you you just don't hold back any punches. You're right out of the gate. Oh, you got to do that around. I love it. I've told I've told Mark from the beginning if if we had English accents, then our AUM would double. You know, oh. Absolutely. Just, uh, you, I, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. I could be talking about a mobile home park, but yet it would still sound good if I had an English accent. My very first business was teaching guys in the firehouse when I worked in the fire department how to how to get a really good English accent out there so they could, you know, get a better dating scenario with uh, with, with girls at the bar after like, you know, midnight, one o'clock. So, hey, I get it, man. There's a lot of upswing to having a, uh, a cool English accent. Now, would, would we have the same benefit if, if Mark went? To, uh, to to England and would he get the, no, get the same? No, no, it's <laughs> terrible, man. The, the, the English are like, oh, here comes another loud mouth American tourist. <laughs> that was snobs. That's that was COVID. COVID. <laughs> right. Hey, so uh, back in England, would Micah be viewed as a wing jing palm? Is that uh... a wing jing palm? I, yeah, you I, know I don't even is. know what that is, man. That's what the Australians good. call call Brits. They call them uh, oh, sir, palms. That's right. Palms, wing jing palms. That's right. Yes. And you know why they called us limeys, right? No. You, you know the background of that? So when we were on the boats coming over to Australia and America, there was no uh, vitamin C. So it was all scurvy. We were all dying of scurvy. Oh, so we were all sucking on lemons and limes. And that's why they called us limeys. A little <laughs> education for you, gentlemen. A little, little history lesson there. Thank there you. you. That's Good. it. I'm done with the history. Let's get down <laughs> to business. Was, that's so great. That's so great. So... So now I guess we get back into the purpose of uh, what our show really is. Uh, as you sure. know, what we get to interview and talk to some of the most amazing entrepreneurs in and in, around the country. Now, you, uh, you are awesome at marketing. You had a great stint in getting yourself positioned on A&E at the time, flipping houses. Tell us a little bit about what uh, Freedom Ventures is doing right now and, and um, you know, how you're yeah. executing. Yeah, great question. Look, Freedom Venture and its current uh, business activities, okay? Um, was really a pivot uh, when COVID hit. Freedom Venture Investments is a two, three year company. Um, it was in the hard money lending business. It's been in the buy, fix and flip business. It's been in the commercial real estate arena um, with smaller portfolios up to a hundred doors. It maxed out at one point. Uh, but when COVID came in and ripped the soul out of the current business structures that we had, uh, primarily lending because Wall Street was no longer buying our um, our notes that we were originating as lenders. Um, it forced uh, it forced us to, to to pivot and really take a look at the landscape. You know, unprecedented guys. It's you know that word's been used over and over and over and over again this year, and rightly so. So when something of that magnitude hits, two things happen: you either succeed or you fail. You pivot, you change, you learn to adapt and overcome, kind of like the military concept. So what I did was this was um, I reconnected with a very dear friend of mine, gentleman by the name of Walter Novicki. He's down in your neck of the woods, Mika. He's in the Sunshine yeah. State, been down there for over 20 years. <laughs> and uh, Walter is in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, and his um, his business track record, as I said, 20 plus years, as to has been to buy commercial real estate. And what we do is is we buy 40 to 140 unit apartment complexes. 
I'm not interested in offices. I'm not interested in hotels. I'm not interested in, in light industry. I'm not interested in any of those assets. I want a, a what we call a core plus asset, which creates cash flow, giving us the plus opportunity to increase its valuation through repositioning. So that's what Freedom Venture Investments is doing today. We're raising capital to buy as many of these uh, complexes as we can. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting time. Our strategies and our understanding of the market, we didn't want it. Well, it's kind of interesting, right? One person's um, chaos is another man's opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. You know, one person's misfortune is somebody else's fortune. And it sounds predatory. But, um, you know, we're beginning to see these, these assets come into pre-foreclosure situations, financially challenge. You know, uh, there's so much volatility in yield uh, in the stock market. The bond market's a joke. Savings mm -hmm. accounts are a joke. You know, so, you know, the, the yield on these assets is, is strong enough to, to really grab the attention of the investors. So that's kind of short version of what we're doing. So, I mean, yeah, we, I can't tell you how many times a day that both of us hear the word pivot. And um, obviously that's right. what, we're, what we're dealing with. But yeah. one of the questions that I had is, um, you know, with the dislocation that we have going on, it seems like everybody, their brother, their sister, their nephews, cousins, whatever, are, you know, looking in this real estate space and, and you know, more so on the, re on the residential side, you see these sure. crazy valuations. We, you sure. know, we've done some national TV on, you know, the flight from the big cities to these, these types of complexes that you're investing in. Yeah. So um, how do you deal with um, the valuations and not like overpaying for things? Yeah, great question. So as you guys know, in the residential marketplace, single family homes up to four units, once we get four units and above, it's classed as a commercial asset. So that zero to three units Valuation is based on CMA, current market analysis. This one sold, it looked like this, it sold in this period of time, that's the valuation. Um, so I don't have to even concern myself with that uh, when it comes to residential valuations because I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, it's so challenging right now in the single family market. If you're a single family investor, just beware, uh, be careful, be fast. Um, speed is of the essence in the single family market right now. You know, the forbearance on foreclosures that was enacted. Well, that's going to, that's not going to be there. It, there's going to be a makeup. There's going to be a catch up where the bank says, okay, it's time to pay. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the majority of Americans can't, they don't have that, that depth. They don't have that, that, you know, that, that, that ability to step up and, and, and come current. So 23% uh, of FHA mortgages are in some kind of delinquency right now nationwide. Uh, that's yeah. more. That's more than we had in 2008. Right. So how do you value something if you, you predict in an influx of inventory? Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you value it when it's specific to, to zip codes? It, it can be a real challenge. So yeah. we, don't play in that, we don't play in that market, right? Yeah. We just don't do it. Mike, I'm just going to do a follow-up on that. I was reading a couple of days ago, something like in excess of 12 million people right now are over $6,000 or more behind in rent. Yeah. Um, how does that impact your space that you play in? Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's a great question as well, right? Because I talk about rental income being the, the, the machine to pay, cat, to, to pay quarterly distributions to investors. So it's interesting when it comes to that number. So we specifically in our, in our business model focus on what's called a B plus or a B class asset. The C class assets, just like you got grades in school, A, B, C, D, E, F, and go home. Remember that grade? Don't even come back to school tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I never got that grade. Summer um, but school. seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time in summer school. I spent a lot of time in the, in the principal's office. Uh, me too. Outside. Yeah. <laughs> they used to say Seymour again, you know, <laughs> what, what? and I'm like, I got bored. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. um, sorry, I digress. <laughs> so A, A properties, um, that's the, the high-end assets. That's your, your high-end condos in Miami, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do business there. The B-class assets is where we see the opportunity. Um, that B-class asset allows us a, a, a renter base that is actually increasing and not decreasing. And here's why. The migration that we've seen from, from the MSAs, from the, the, the metropolitan areas has been unprecedented. So that creates um, a, a need 
in the tenant base for us, number one. Number two, we're going to see an increase as these foreclosures begin to hit and we start to see that single family asset no longer be a, vi uh, a viable uh, purchase um, for a lot of people. So that increases it as well. And here's the magic. In my business, in commercial real estate, we buy based on actual numbers. We don't buy on pro formas. The realtor will try and sell, the commercial realtor will sell on a pro forma. If you raise the rents, the building will be worth this. Well, I don't reward amateur property owners for, for not raising rents, for not paying attention to, to marketing, not paying attention to um, you know, repairs, et cetera, et cetera. So when you buy based on actual numbers, I'm always buying at the right valuation. Um, I'm not. I'm not paying somebody for work they've not done. Does that make sense? Did I deliver? Yeah, that totally. Yeah, you're not. You're not. Pay, you're not looking to give them credit for a futuristic result of uh, non-optimization. I guess you know, being right. very wordy, but basically, you're uh, you're kicking out uh, the cold water and making sure that um, you're not you're not paying for. You know, it could be like a stock, right? Sometimes, right. Take a Tesla. You know, for example, they're they're uh, trading on a futuristic result. Sure uh, they are. Sure so, they are. Yeah. Is that, is Let me ask you guys a question. Let me ask you guys a question because I think there's definitely- hey, we're the host. Um, can't ask us questions. I can do whatever I want. I got a funny <laughs> accent. All right. I, I, I've used this analogy a lot. And with your guys' background and experience, I, I'd like either a thumbs up or a thumbs down and I'm cool either way. I don't know your world. I've never been a, a, a stock investor. You know, I, I, you start talking to me about that world and, and I glaze over. It's not my, you know, it's not my core expertise. But what I do know is this, and, and this is very big picture. You take a guy like Buffett, right? Identifies underperforming businesses. And he says, I'm going to buy that underperforming business based on its current valuation, right? Gets rid of bad managers, bad CEOs, bad debt, however he does what he does, restructures the business and makes it more valuable. Is that a fair statement as to like big picture, kind of what Buffett does? And if that is the case, then for the person who's new to my world, think of it exactly the same way. I take a 40 to 140 unit apartment complex, usually with, with bad management, um, too expensive management, um, a tenant base, which is not doing what it needs to do, uh, minor repairs that should have been done, you know, last year, the year before, the year before, we look at the expense ratio, the income to expense ratio, we identify problems, we reposition it and do exactly the same thing. So my question is, is that kind of a fair analogy? Because I believe it is, but you know, again, you know, it's not my wheelhouse when it comes to, you know, taking a business. Does that make sense? I think we could give you a, a, a thumbs up on that. Would, yeah, what All would right. you say, Mark? Yeah, I, I would, yeah. I, I mean, very, uh, absolutely very synergistic. Um, I would say that uh, I don't have a crystal ball into exactly what his methodology is in selecting companies, but I know that cash flow is is something that um, you know reoccurring cash flow is is very valuable. Um, and then obviously extrapolating inefficiencies and like you right. said, the management and. Um, but uh, he seems to buy like if you look at the portfolio, a lot of them are cash flow specific, have good track records and lots of different you know environments. A lot of insurance companies that are very cash yeah. flow centric and stuff. Um, and definitely, you know, good management. He doesn't normally, I don't think, go in and make wholesale changes on management when, you know, they're there. He's looking for companies. Um, and, and the way that the organization's structured, it's a very small type of thing. He he tries to find, you know, good business people that are effective, um, but mostly cash flow. Would you agree, Micah? That's that's kind of how yeah. the focus is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would. And I've, I've got a question for you now. When when you think about the the landscape of of the the type of individuals that need to rent at least usually is, is a lot of in, in college or, or or just graduating from college how do you feel the the current covid environment is going to affect some of these college towns that have high concentrations of um the types of properties that that are yeah. good deals that you yeah guys that's use? a great question as well mike uh, look his there are a lot of investors right now in the commercial arena, in the college towns that relied on that student base that are just holding on for dear life. All right, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna be very direct with it. Mm -hmm. The challenge is this, is you can do anything in life, either as an amateur or as a professional, right? 
uh, the professional is somebody who learns, implements what they learn, gets their own lumps and bumps and bruises along the way, right? You really, you're in the trenches. Um, you know, somebody who just comes in at a high level, reads a book, and I don't care what, it, what it's on, right? I could get a book right now on stock investing. It doesn't mean I know what the hell I'm doing, right? So these college towns, these property owners, there is a high percentage of them who are what we call the mom and pop organizations, right? 20 to maybe 100 doors, the smaller unit complexes. They never had any reserves. They never had any professional um, systems in place for, for managing tenant base and repairs, et cetera. So they're, they're hurting. They're hurting. That's going to create opportunities. And we see that in our own um, uh, hunting area. So we're from I-41 up the coast, I-75 inland, Gulf Coast region of Florida. From, from all the way down to the Keys up to Orlando is where we hunt and pick. But we see the same thing in, in what we buy as, as, the, um, as the collegiate uh, property owners are seeing. It's a scary time. Will it come back? Yes. Kids will go back to college, right? right? They'll go back en masse. We won't be remote forever in the education space. I don't know about you, brother, but some people say people go to college just for the, the uh, social experience rather than the education. I don't know what the hell that means, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, it's definitely a challenge. It's a challenged um, um, demographic, for want of a better term. Yeah. Now, are we seeing, are you seeing some of the valuations or are we still too early? You know, I remember all the, the accounts of Blackstone coming into the Florida region and, and picking yeah. up. I think yeah. well, it seems like they were focusing more on the single family, but are you starting to see the valuations come, like more deals coming yeah. on the market? That's, that's a great question. Um, we are. The rest of the world isn't right. All right. And, and why is that? Well, when you've been a performer with a track record of over 20 years in one specific market, you know, when, when the shit hits the fan and people have that challenge, those mom and pops that I just described, we get that first phone call. So for us, the valuation and the inbound leads um, have overtaken any outbound marketing and conversations that we were having back in, March, April, May, um, end of May, beginning of June, kind of interest, interestingly enough, like the end of a quarter, right? Three, four months of, of lack of performance. Then we saw the lead generation coming in. And again, to, to, to just to back up, we, we buy based on a certain buy box. Okay. And the question could be reframed, Mika, can you, can you find assets in your buy box without deviating, right? No, we don't have to squeeze a deal. I used to teach that. If you're squeezing a deal, trying to find a dollar in there, it's not a deal. Move on. All right, okay. let it go, right? So yeah, we don't yeah. have to squeeze anything. Uh, we can buy based on the actual numbers because the need is there today. Where, yeah, where, a, sorry, Mark, I want to ask, where are yeah, you yeah. seeing this? Because we do have a lot, of, a lot of people listening to our show or are, are in real estate heavily. Where, where would you say is the sweet spot right now for, for, the, for, your, for your sector, what you're looking at? Yeah, it's um, it's so our buy box is our sweet spot, and we okay. can we can fulfill the orders. Mm -hmm. Okay, put it that way, right? Okay. Um, we buy forty to one hundred and forty unit apartment complexes, B class assets. So that means nineteen ninety or sooner. Um, they have to meet a certain um, income to expense ratio so that we can put the the plus part of a core asset um, in the play. The plus meaning a repositioning. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing more than we can buy, which okay. is which is hard. And it's all in the Gulf Coast region of Florida. I don't have to go to Houston to find a deal. I don't have to go to the Carolinas to find a deal. There is plenty, and I mean this sincerely, plenty of inventory for us to buy right now. But here's what's interesting. People say to me all the time, well, what about the bigger ones, the, the 200 to the 500 doors? Those are still going at market value and getting overbought. Because the people with the deeper pockets, the big boys from Wall Street, the larger institutional buyers, they're coming in and they're, they're, they're outbidding each other on those things. And it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. my, my classification, it's a smaller, I catch everything else that falls between the cracks. And that's what creates the double digit targeted returns for our investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, well, that does phenomenal information. And, you know, as you know, this show really tries to impart some knowledge on being an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I know that you've changed your business model just a little bit with COVID. For our listeners that are out there with your, 
your track record and some of the things that you've been able to do from a marketing perspective, is there any advice that you would give, uh, maybe not in your particular industry, but in general, someone that, um, you know, is starting or running a business, is there any knowledge that you could impart? Yeah, I, I would. And I, I always talk about authenticity, right? A lot of people believe that they have to put on a certain persona, right? And we had a lot of fun before we even started recording. All three of us were authentic, right? There was no, no airs and graces. Um, people will do business with people that they like. Um, if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know the answer, but I'll get it for you. It's kind of like that military background. And I think one of the most important things that, that seems to fall through the cracks is really knowing who your client is, right? Like you guys would say, hey, we're in finance. You're not in finance. The business is people. Understanding what your client's end goals are financially and then creating a portfolio plan that meets their requirements. Um, I've had people that come to our, our fund and I turn them away. I say, no, your money's not gonna fit here. It doesn't work. Our goals and our, our methodology don't fit your plans. So, you know, to thine own self be true, I guess, is the bottom line on it. I, I, I live, breathe that today. It's um, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should do something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so be, be authentic and, and without getting corny, guys, find the win-win. You know, find it. it it's legitimate. It's not, it's not bullshit. It's not like stuff in the sky. Win-wins are real. Um, testimonies from clients um, drive business. And um, if you don't have a, a, a database of, of testimonies of people that you have serviced, um, then, you know, you might not be on the right track. I've got, a, I got a, a little banner over here. It's actually a Zig Ziglar quote. And a friend of mine gave it to me and I love it. It says, you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. You know what I mean? That's totally true. Yeah, no, that that's very valuable advice. And then um, I hate to hate to sandbag you, but what don't you do well? Let's always we always get details. Oh, you're not sandbagging (laughs) me. I own it, baby. I own it. I I hate the minutiae. Oh, oh, it makes me throw up. (laughs) Here's what I learned. I, I learned this the hard way. Um, you, you know, you talk about me being good at marketing. I suck at marketing, but I find the best people around me who are good at marketing. And mm-hmm. they say, Dave, shoot a video and say this. I go, okay, that's my thing. I got that. <laughs> you know, Dave, do this. Dave, do this. Um, you know, sales and marketing. Um, I'm good at sales. I ain't so good at the marketing piece. So I learned a long time ago, I don't have to know everything, but I have to have the right people around me who do. Mm-hmm. Again, a little tip on it is real simple, man. It's like, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, like, oh, I'm the CEO. Stop <laughs> it. You're not. You, you put your pants on the same way as everybody else, you ding dong, right? Stay, <laughs> stay, right? stay, stay grounded. So, you know, I don't, I don't pretend. Um, it's okay to, to have some weaknesses um, because those um, highlight your strengths, to be real. Yeah, details are not my favorite. Good, good. So ultimately, hire, hiring the right people to to handle those jobs that 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 is their core competency. That's good. Yeah, that's good yeah, feedback too. For sure. Yeah. Um, now, what would you say is one of the biggest challenges that you're finding now in light of all that uh, that that we're that yeah, we're all that's, experiencing? In that's a great question too, man. I tell you, um, you know, when we started raising capital for our fund, so it's a hundred million dollar fund. Um, my partner, Walter, has raised $125 million on his own throughout his career, deployed it, paid it back with the promised interest, et cetera, et cetera. So I came in uh, with my partners with a little naivety, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm like, 100 mil? Yeah, no problem. And all of our marketing was geared towards the uh, retail investor self-directed retirement accounts. Um, you know, uh, we, we only work with accredited investors. So I thought that raising money was going to be pretty easy. You know, we got the TV brand behind us. My partner's Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. You know, you get that expertise. No, mm. no, it's, it's not easy, right? It's not easy. So, you know, the biggest challenge we had was a mix of institutional conversations and marketing and yet at the same time, staying true to my own background, right? Which is that, that working class feet on the street mentality 
for, you know, the retired firefighter, teacher, uh, you know, um, business owner, restaurant owner, that kind of thing. So raising capital and understanding how to, how to get your messaging correct. And it's funny, we got some institutions that, that have our, our funded due diligence right now, and they may very well take us out with two checks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, maybe we could have been doing that in the very beginning. <clears throat> but I think every lesson is a valuable lesson, whether, you know, whether everything is successful or not. So right now we're around 50-50 between retail and institutional um, uh, discussions uh, with, with investors coming forward. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not easy. You know what? Um, I does a, often like tell some of our business owners this, but oftentimes people remember that movie, Field the Dreams, Build It, They oh, Will yeah. Come. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it sounds nice, but it's not always about the perfect mousetrap. It sounds to me like you you constantly have to figure out you got to get your hands dirty, get in there and, and, and you know, really kind of tweak some of the, the formulas yeah. because it's just not like the field of dreams build it. They don't always come. You've got to oh. be listening and seeing what's working and make the changes as they present themselves. You, you know what that requires? And, and I think it's a rarity that requires humility, right? Yeah. Humility, ego, E-G-O, in my opinion, stands for ease God out, right? That's, that's ego. That's like, ah, like I said before. So if you can, if you can um, accept some humility and deploy it, then you can listen. Like I'm good at talking. I'm not really great at listening sometimes. And I've learned quickly to, to listen. And what, what we're beginning to find is, is from, from some of the institutional investors to be able to, to make, get the messaging correct and dialed in is we're now looking at, at two concepts. There could be some what we call syndicated deals where a group of investors come in on just one asset. And then we've also got the, the fund itself, which is a whole group of investors coming in. Um, and they're not specifically on one asset, but they own shares in the management company that owns all the assets. Mm -hmm. So being able to, to listen to, to the needs of other people, you know, is what, because um, then, then it doesn't matter that the, the field of dreams is now a reality. Right. Um, you know, being able to, I always, I, I learned this very early on. If you find the deal, the money will come. Well, we got the deal. We don't have one deal. We've got, you know, one a week mm -hmm. that we could potentially buy. Um, so the money just, what it is, is, is the message needs to be loud enough for the money to hear it. Cause if the money can't hear it, it doesn't matter how great the deal is. Mm -hmm. That's like the like the the uh, the fine print, if you will, <laughs> or the caveat that goes with you yeah. know, great deal finds money. So it's um you know it's it's a daily it's a daily um, pivot. I mean, you, you could pivot in one conversation. You know, you go in with one thought, and you you end up c coming out with a different result. So. Mm -hmm. It's, well, you're uh, you're now our favorite bloke. Uh, so cool, blimey. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. I, I and on behalf of my Wing Jing palm below me. Um, What's up, Wing Jing? <laughs> <laughs> I like I like to thank you for coming on the show. I'd remind our listeners that again, you can follow us on the shrimptank.com forward slash Boston, Google Stitch, SoundCloud, Apple, basically anywhere you can follow your podcasts. Uh, you'll be able to grab us there. We'd love to get your followership. Dave, um, for our listeners, what is the best way if they want more information about you or your company? What's the best way? Yeah, to I, I'm, I'm available. Um, you can call me directly. Just say that you came in through the Shrimp Tech podcast. Um, you can call me directly at 781-922-4418. And now I'm going to do that Vanna White moment. Or you can always go to Freedom Venture. <laughs> com. I'd like to buy a vowel. Oh, this way. Oh, is it that way? I don't know whether... Where up or down or whatever. <laughs> can you, know, you, you can give me an app? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be. Totally you don't look as good as Vanna, but you'll, you know, you're you're funny, so that's good I'm, stuff. I'm doing I'm doing the best I can with what God gave me. It ain't easy. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, reach out to us at freedomventure.com uh, um, or call me seven eight one nine two two. 4418. But please, if you do call that number, just say you came in from the from the Shrimp Tank uh, podcast uh, so that uh, I know where you're coming from. And let's have a conversation, see if I can help you. All right. That's sure. great. Well, thanks again for your time. And uh, we'll look forward to some updates in the future. Appreciate yeah. it, guys. Take care. Thanks for having me on the show, Dave. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.